Okay, and there's a couple of them that might live, but yeah, go ahead. Put a bomb on a destroyer. There you go. <laughs> I'm telling you, this game always punishes you for Hey folks, it's Pat here. Welcome back. Um, here we are at the, our last battle in our Carriers of War series, the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Now, this one's going to be very different than the previous battles we fought. In the previous battles, as the Americans, we're usually the underdog. In this one, we are going to win. Okay, it is that simple. And we are going to take out not only Ozawa, but all of these guys here. Notice that we don't have any land-based commanders, and that's because... All of our air power, all 900 planes that we have, which is way more than we've had in on any of the other scenarios. In fact, many of them put together um, are going to come off our new fleet of aircraft carriers, which we're going to use to wreck the Japanese here. Now, um, <clears throat> this battle, I don't play this one very much. Just because in this game in particular, I like to challenge myself, which I did so to great effect in the Santa Cruz battle. <laughs> so, but um, this one, it's it's important to go through this one, not just for historical reasons, but because, you know, the designers of this game did a good job of punching this one in here, not just because it's a battle um, where there are carriers, which is kind of the theme of the game, but because when, when you fight this battle, either as the Japanese or the Americans, you, you kind of really get... A good idea of the flavor of the war at this point in time and so let's set the scenario up shall we it's uh june 16th 1944 so d-day was 10 days ago okay and that's important we'll come back to that point here in just a second but the americans um two two prong strategy the one was with macarthur who wants to get back to the philippines and he's pretty close to doing so at this point in time in fact they'll do it here in just a couple months um but during that time uh the navy really pushed into the Central Pacific, okay, using springboarding off the success that it, it had in Guadalcanal, um, which was brutal, brutal combat that lasted a long time, really beat up the Navy, but really they went back to the drawing board. And this this battle was kind of in the works since 1940 with the Two Ocean Navy Act um, because, of course, America started, you know, cranking up its shipbuilding production at that point in time. And now we're going to see the fruits, uh, the fruit of all those labors here. And so here we go. Um, we are going, these are all our fleets, all these white dots here. Those are our different task groups. And so we are bringing the United States 5th Fleet, uh, which would alternate between the 5th and the 3rd Fleet. They just call it something different depending on who commanding it. Today our commander is Raymond Spruance. And so we call it the 5th Fleet. All right. Um, this is it. Okay. And we are going to invade this place right here which is Saipan, okay? Um, this is Guam down here. This is Truk down here, which is the big naval base that was backstopping all the Japanese operations during Guadalcanal, but has basically been isolated by air raids and surface attacks and submarines in particular. And so it's basically useless at this point. The Japanese fleet had a ski daddle out of here and go hang out down in Indonesia where it was really close to its fuel supply. But um, <clears throat> Japanese knew that eventually the Americans were going to show up, and so they decided to show up here and take Saipan, all right? Which, of course, they'll turn into a, the whole strategy for the Central Pacific is turn this into an air base, a great big air base, because they know the B-29s, like, just around the corner in the production line, and those can reach Japan from here. <clears throat> Japan's pretty close. Just to show you, this is Iwo Jima right here. And this is Okinawa. So Japan's up here, not too far away. So we've really started to take the fight to them. All right. And so here, let's take a look at our fleets. We got three of them. All right. So we have Mark Mitcher and famous Task Force 38 or 58 in this case. Um, this is the fruit of the American industrial system. And let me show you what I'm talking about. So we have one, two, three, four, five task groups, and they contain all of the most modern, most lethal ships in the American arsenal. Okay, yes, D-Day is taking place over there, okay, in France right now. America did not send its naval units over there that it needed. It sent it as it sent its its needed and its top of the line naval units over here to the Pacific. And so let's take a look at them. In this group we have the Lexington. Oh, well, first of all, we still have our old friend, the Enterprise, okay, which, of course, I lost in Coral, or in um, 
I think both Midway Battle and Santa Cruz not too long ago, but she's back. All right, but then we have the Lexington again, and this is not the Lexington as we knew her. This is the new USS Lexington, which is an Essex class carrier. The Essex class carrier was scratch built, um, ground up carrier design that would stay in service in the United States Navy. I think the Lexington herself was probably in in the United States Naval roster until the early 1980s. <laughs> So at this point in time, the Americans are very, very serious, and we have built this brand new carrier. And just take a look at it, okay? Look at our anti-aircraft. This is our heavy AA and our light AA, so it's just stacked with anti-aircraft guns. Our damage control crews and our fire control crews are fantastic. We have the most up-to-date radar on this ship, and we have lots of these, okay? So just in this group here, we have the Lexington. The Enterprise, our old friend, but we also have light carriers as well. Americans said, hey, we need more carriers. And so, yes, a Lexington class or an Essex class carrier takes quite a bit of time to build. So what can we build a little bit faster? And so they came up with these light carrier designs as well. And so we have a bunch of those. Here's the Princeton and the San Jacinto. Okay. That's just one group. Here's another group, the Hornet. Okay. Where notice that we're naming ships over ones that we've lost before. And the Hornet and the Yorktown are in that group. Okay, Essex class carriers along with the Bella Wood and the Baton. Okay, notice that we're naming ships after the battles that we've already fought in this war. <laughs> so we're getting really serious. We have the Bunker Hill and the, re and the next version of the USS Wasp. Again, heavy carriers along with the Monterey and the Cabot. And again, here's our lead ship in the class, the Essex. Okay, so in the Calpens and the Langley, I've lost count as to how many carriers we have. A lot. And then, not just that, okay, notice that we have our anti-aircraft cruisers back with us here. And um, a lot of these, like here, the Vincennes, which used to be a heavy cruiser that was lost earlier in the war, all right, has been rebirthed as a light cruiser that, of course, is just stocked with anti-aircraft guns. That was American doctrine at this point in time. If it's got a square foot of ground on it, put a machine gun that can point up. <laughs> and then last but not least, of course, pre-war doctrine was always like, hey man, we're going to have a big battleship fight. And it only happened like once, okay, in, in Guadalcanal. And so, you know, America had a whole bunch of fast, sexy battleships and they had no idea what to do with them, all right? They just they didn't really have that much of a purpose. And so they said, okay, put them all together, <laughs> send them with the carriers, and see if they can make themselves useful. And so here's all our battleships. This is the vast bulk of the American fast battleship fleet with North Carolina and Washington, okay, sister ships. Three of the four South Dakota-class battleships right there. And here you go for all you nerds out there, and I'm one of you. All right, there she is, the USS Iowa and the New Jersey. All right, New Jersey, probably one of the most fightingest ships in the 20th century. Even though she didn't fight all that much, she certainly was in all the wars. <laughs> so all the way up to the point in time where, what was it? Was it the New Jersey? It was either New Jersey or the Wisconsin and the Missouri who actually fought fired on Iraq in 1991. I think it's Missouri. <laughs> I don't know. So before, well, yeah, they detached her so that she could be in a movie. <laughs> so, but there they are. So there's our Iowa-class battleships. Um, not the greatest graphic, you know. I mean, most of you know the profile of the ship probably by heart. Pretty close, I guess. You know, it'll do. <laughs> we'll use it to shoot down some Japanese planes. <laughs> So there's our fleets, all right? So let me show you where fast ships are. Here's Mark Mitchell's groups. They're split into two up here and then three down here, and I think these are our battleships right here. Plan for this battle is pretty straightforward. These guys are going to invade here. We're going to take these guys. We're going to park them out here. And we're going to wait. We're going to wait for the Japanese, which is exactly what Ray Bruins did in this battle. Um, so Lexington's our flag group, so we're just going to order her to about here. We'll have the other two groups down here bunch up on her with an escort order. And that includes the North Carolina group. I want you on escort order as well. And then the two up here, which is the Hornet. Bring you down here. And the same thing with the Essex. 
bring you down here okay so I'll have a screen of heavy carriers <laughs> imagine that we can say that now I'm gonna have a screen of heavy heavy carriers that'll wait for the Japanese because remember the Japanese were down here in Indonesia they got to thread their way through the Philippines they'll pop up in this area in about a day or so we got four days for this battle um, my gut tells me we'll probably need about two and a half okay these guys we're just going to let them do what they do let me just kind of show you around those here a little bit here's kelly turner so um kelly turner was basically the architect of america's floating army which included the um i think it's the fifth amphibious corps uh, well there were multiple amphibious corps if i'm not mistaken but it's basically the navy's private army it's going to be two three two two marine divisions at least one army division they're going to land those seventy thousand guys here <clears throat> on um Saipan tomorrow and so take a look at this is just destroyers that they use for backup and shore bombardment close in support and then these transports these transports are what we need to protect because they're full of marines and you know the amphibious transports at this point in time had gotten really sophisticated I mean there's all kinds of specialized ones there were ones that you know would stand off the beach and then just basically barf out you know m tra or um, uh, Amtrak's uh, which is basically marine tanks or there were other ones that would just beach themselves pop open the doors on the front and just barf out a whole bunch of tanks and guys so the marines after you know their experiences and the gilberts um they got pretty good at this okay and you know i mean it's a tradition they still try and keep up today of course but we need to protect these guys <clears throat> But that's a transport group. It's going to invade uh, Saipan, um, so we're just going to let them do that. They're supported by uh, uh, bombardment groups, which, you know, not only did the Americans, like, build a brand new fleet basically from scratch, they took the old one and made it better. <laughs> so we've got some um, Pearl Harbor veterans here, the Tennessee, the California, and the Maryland, okay, which are basically going to show up outside of um, – of uh, Saipan, these guys going down to Tinian here, which is an airbase that's pretty close, and they're just going to rain down 16 and 40, 14 inch shells on it. So they never expected these ships to actually, you know, fight, slug it out, duke it out, Jutland style again. Although that would happen one time later, just by sheer chance. But um, these guys have been repurposed, okay, and so they have veteran crews on them, and they just love raining down shells on Japanese troops, and so we're going to let them do that. And then, of course, th these guys have carriers as well, okay, and so these, these groups had their own organic carrier force, which were uh, consists of these little escort carriers, which they only hold a couple dozen planes. All right, but they're perfect for close-in support. Marines need some guys on the ground, okay? They have some guys on the ground. They need, you know, that bunker taken out. They call in a couple Avengers, and, you know, they just fly in and fly out, you know, quick 20-minute missions kind of thing. Go back, refuel, rearm. And so, and then on top of that, they would stock these these with fighters. And so we're going to have for each one of these transport groups is going to have its own cap umbrella over it, regardless of all our big carriers. We don't even have to worry about using those to protect these guys until we spot the Japanese fleet, okay? And so, um, just to show you uh, what else has changed, okay? Which, okay, so we have a bunch of cool, sexy, shiny new ships, but we also have really wonderful airplanes at this point in time. So let me show you what these look like. Here's the Essex, all right? And we have this guy right here, which is the F6F Hellcat. Okay, which is, you know, the successor to the Wildcat. I think there's still a couple Wildcats in this battle, but we've basically replaced them all with this guy, which is basically the Wildcat's big brother. Now, this plane was developed in record time because after the first couple initial battles with Zeros, between Zeros and Wildcats, some of the eight Wildcat aces went back to the United States, went to the Grumman factory, which in Grumman's the guys who made these, and said, hey, look, we want this, this, and this. We want we want a plane that's faster, can climb further, can climb quicker, can turn, you know, the much better turn radius, uh, holds more machine gun bullets, has a cockpit that's higher so we can see down, better visibility, um, longer range. And Grumman basically said, all right. <laughs> and they built it in less than a year and then cranked out hundreds of them all right and basically restocked every single aircraft carrier in the u.s fleet 
with these planes, which are going to absolutely destroy anything that comes our way. Okay. And so what I like to do in this battle is um, we're, we're going to get hit with a lot of land-based attacks in the next day. We're just going to put up cap like crazy. And I'm going to show you exactly how lethal these planes have gotten. So usually what I do is I take about every carrier and I put up about half their guys on cap. And that's just because we can absorb some losses then, but at the same point in time, uh, we reserve some for strike capability. And so all of these carriers here are just going to have an absolute swarm of planes protecting them tomorrow. And that's not the only thing that's protecting these ships now. So remember I was talking about in the Santa Cruz battle, um, you know, American fleet doctrine had kind of changed a little bit where they bunch up all the ships so they can concentrate their AA fire. Well, they're still doing that, but now they have a super secret weapon. In some of the larger caliber AA guns, they actually developed uh, proximity fuse. And so rather than setting the fuse to explode at a certain altitude, um, now, every fuse on a large caliber anti-aircraft gun has a little teeny tiny radar in it. <laughs> That's how sophisticated we're getting. And so you don't even have to shoot, you know, the right altitude. You just shoot towards whatever is coming at you, and it explodes when it gets close to it, which is usually enough to put down any of the Japanese planes, which, of course, were very lightly. Oh, my God, we got so much cap here, man. I mean, this is kind of cap overkill. But I'm just telling you, we're going to shoot down every last thing that comes our way tomorrow. And so with these guys here, <clears throat> and these are the, uh, the little Jeep carriers that are protecting the invasion fleet, we're going to put everybody on cap. Although in the actual battle, they'd only put about half of these guys up on cap, and the other half would go strafe. Um, of course, troops and positions on the ground but we don't have to worry about that in this in this game so we will just put them all on cap and that way oh he, see here's some wildcats so we still have some of the trusty old wildcats and if you're if you're a, a fan of flight sims um one of my favorites was uh uh what was it microsoft combat flight simulator 2 which was set in the pacific and you got pretty good with a wildcat. Um, you realize that you were basically, I mean, there were a lot of advantages that the Zero had on you, but, you know, you could get, I mean, you, you could pull some pretty cool stuff if you're actually trying um, and if you learn from some of your mistakes. But um, the minute you got your hands on a Hellcat, it was like upgrading from a Ford F-150 to a Ferrari. <laughs> That was as beefy as an F-150. <laughs> so, you know, it was just like, oh my God, this is so unfair. And that's kind of the flavor behind this battle. So here we are at dawn. We're just going to run this hour by hour. It'll probably be an hour or two before we start seeing some airstrikes. We've got search planes radiating out in every single direction. Chances are we're going to bait almost all of the airstrikes with our carriers here. Um... You know, because Japanese pilots, they don't want to go after transports, you know, you know, that's just a low priority target. So when we can take out a carrier, oh no, look at that, they're going to prove me wrong. <laughs> okay, they're going to run out there and try and bomb something. Let's see what they go decide to bomb. So but usually, almost always, they go after these groups here. But we might take a couple hits. There's a light carrier, but look at this. I mean, these are just the wildcats are going to shoot down. These are duties. These are brand new Japanese dive bombers, and it's not even going to matter. We're just going to absolutely tear them to pieces. Okay, there's a couple of them that might live, but yeah, go ahead, put a bomb on a destroyer. There you go. <laughs> I'm telling you, this game always punishes you for that. Betty Bomber's coming after Gambier Bay here. Maybe you can get a hit on her. So they can actually launch torpedoes. Huh. That'd be kind of interesting. I don't think this thing could take too many torpedoes. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Fan shop, AZ. I don't even know all the carrier names now. So we got that many of them. So, but our cap's still up. So I was still chasing these guys around. 
<clears throat> and of course, you know, these aren't our heavy groups, so you don't see the quite the concentration of anti-aircraft fire, but look, all those attacks are gone now at this point in time. So you can just keep running this. There's some Judy to see if they get one more hit here. Nope. So I thought Judy was a cool looking plane. So but cool looking and effective are two different things, obviously. So he asked the Germans about that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of German students. I love to pick on them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love them all. I love them all, though. <laughs> all right, here we go. Here's a guy coming over here. He's going to attack one of our carrier groups. We'll see if any one of these guys actually gets in there or if he decides to wave off. They might not even find us at this point in time. So, yep, yeah, okay, here we go. we got a strike coming in this way. Maybe... Maybe heading towards both those. It looks like a strike's coming down there towards the southern group. But look at this. France is, you know, the medium bombers just absolutely run into this buzzsaw of cap and flak. Have you ever seen some of those late war pictures where the entire sky, or the movies are even better, and especially if you can see some of the color ones where the entire sky is just full of flak and, you know, splashes like on every hundred yards um, away from the carrier. And that's just, of course, falling shells. And I mean, you just you, there's you can't survive flying through that, okay? And that's exactly what all these pilots are facing right now. So <clears throat> it's just absolutely terrifying what the Americans were able to actually build, and then of course launch outside of their own land-based uh, coverage. And we got more strikes coming in. We're just gonna, we're just going to let them come. We do the same thing when their carriers show up the next day or so. We're just going to run, and in fact, let's just run this till dusk. So, because we don't need to change a single thing that we're doing. I'm just going to sit out here and say, come at me, and they'll launch airstrikes at us, and we're going to just basically chew up all their groups. So, I mean, most of these squadrons, they'll come out here, you know, 15, 20 planes, and none of them will make it back home. None of them. So, and that's, you know, it just kind of shows like at this point in time in the war Japan had become really outclassed and I mean I think about it it's 10 days after D-Day we got this entire thing going on over there in Europe you know with I mean we land 150,000 people on the first day so and supported with hundreds of ships and you know just tons of planes but you know and 10 days later we're doing the exact same thing in the Pacific so exact same thing so you know we're going to land 70,000 Marines here so well marines and army guys so and it's just it's it's just an absolute slaughter absolute slaughter and you know from a gaming perspective this is not the kind of battle you want to fight okay you, you want a good fight you want to actually put up like um you know you, you want to give the other guys a chance you want to give yourself some challenge and things like that but as a historical simulation um, it's really important that they kept this battle in here, and I'm really glad that the designers did because it just kind of it it, it kind of you get the feel for how the war has changed. Okay, in the beginning of the war, it's it's bare knuckle and it's nail biting and it's just it. I mean, oh my gosh, it's just I mean, it's stressful. <laughs> and I mean, I'm sure, yeah, landing you know <laughs> on, on Saipan as a marine was horribly stressful, but at the same point in time. Um, if I'm Admiral Nimitz and this thing's launching right now, I mean, I know that I've done my homework and that the folks behind me have, have given me all they've got and that's all I need. That's all I need at this point in time, you know? And that, 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 that's why, oh, there's a torpedo hit on the Nahin, in Nahinta Bay. <laughs> so she might not actually survive that. Maybe we'll get another one here. So we'll have to break and check it out. So, but notice they're going after the carriers too. So what they really need to be doing is going after the transports, and they're not doing that. So, probably just sent enough here to actually bust through that cap. So, um, let's go check that out here real quick. I think that was Connolly. Yeah, yeah, we might lose, we might lose a little Jeep carrier there. So that sucks, but it is what it is. <laughs> you know, the Japanese are going to lose a lot more tomorrow. <laughs> a lot more. In fact, they're going to lose everything. 
So that's the setup for this battle. Um, our battleships will come in there. They'll probably start bombarding here pretty soon. But just wanted to kind of give you a flavor for this one before the, the, the big shooting starts tomorrow. Now, we're going to radiate out search planes here. We're going to spot something if it's there to be spotted. And then we're going to make a beeline for it. We're going to let them hit us first. We're going to shoot down their entire air group using F6F Hellcats, proximity fuses, and dense formations. And then as soon as that strike is gonzo, we're going to follow them home. All right, and just absolutely take them out. So... A um, little bit of a somber battle here, but also if you've gone through a lot of the pain of the earlier um, scenarios in this one, this one's got a little bit of payoff for it, and uh, we'll see if we can get that in tomorrow. Hope to see you there. Take care. Bye.